Friends, welcome to this daily devotion. I'm Pastor Mark, and I have the privilege of serving the United Methodist Church of the Frankfurt, Mokina, and New Lenox areas. I ask that you come to this time with an open heart and an open mind. Ready yourself that we may truly come into the presence of God and leave transformed as people living in abundant life. Friends, hear the invocation. Almighty God, you are the light and life of every soul and our own source of hope. Grant that in this time of worship, we may experience your transforming power, preparing us for the ministry of this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, our theme this week as we approach Palm Passion Sunday or Palm Sunday is the wounds and sorrows of ministry. At the end of this week's Sunday, Palm Sunday, uh, we generally celebrate the triumphant entry in, uh, into Jerusalem that Jesus and his disciples made. Jesus riding on a donkey, palm branches, waving Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Often we use that opportunity to share the whole story of that week, that last week of Jesus's life, his arrest, execution, that holy Saturday of waiting. Of course, we offer that throughout that week, and next week we will reflect on that last week in depth. But as we approach that beginning of the end, let's focus on our theme, the wounds and sorrows of ministry. Our theme psalm is Psalm 56. Uh, today, we'll read it in its entirety. There's a word or a phrase that just reaches out to you. Just make a note of it in your Bible. Make a note in your phone or jot it down on a piece of paper. Come back to it. Put it on your mirror so you reflect on that every day. Just a word or a phrase. See what God is speaking to you today. Psalm 56. For the music leader, according to the silent dove of distant places, a miktam of David, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. God, have mercy on me, because I'm being trampled. All day long the enemy oppresses me. My attackers trample me all day long, because I have so many enemies. Exalted one, whenever I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, I trust in God, I won't be afraid. What can mere flesh do to me? All day long they frustrate my pursuits. All their thoughts are evil against me. They get together and set an ambush. They are watching my steps, hoping for my death. Don't rescue them for any reason. In wrath, bring down the people, God. You yourself have kept track of my misery. Put my tears into your bottle. Aren't they on your scroll already? Then my enemies will retreat when I cry out. I know this because God is mine. God whose word I praise. The Lord whose word I praise. I trust in God. I won't be afraid. What can anyone do to me? I will fulfill my promises to you, God. I will present thanksgiving offerings to you because you have saved my life from death, saved my feet from stumbling so that I can walk before God in the light of life. God bless the reading of the psalm. I love that psalm. Again, if there's a word or a phrase, we'll come back to it throughout the week, but there's a word or a phrase that just kind of popped. Go back and listen to it again if you need to listen to it or get your Bible out, read it or your Bible app and see what might be speaking. Make some notes. I like to like write poetry or uh, do haikus or a haikus type of poetry, but uh, little reflections in my journal about the different Psalms and what I read uh, gives me some different perspective. Our anthology reading uh, is uh, from a journal from John Wesley, uh, the founder of the Methodist movement, or one of the founders of the Methodist movement, I should say. Uh, and this is a very famous reading from his journal. In the evening, I went very unwillingly 
to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change in which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. God bless this powerful recollection from John Wesley's journal. John if you're not familiar with his story, uh, was an Anglican priest. He grew up the son of an Anglican priest. He grew up one of 19 children. His mother spent time with each of them, teaching them about the faith. His father was a fire brimstone kind of preacher and, and poet. Uh, and, and uh, you know, some of the parishioners got so mad uh, when John was growing up at his father, Samuel, that they tried to burn the parsonage down. Uh, and, and, and John uh, narrowly escaped the burning parsonage. His mother described him as a bran plucked from the burning. John went on to become an accomplished fellow at Oxford. He became an Anglican priest, a priest in the church in England or a pastor in the church of England. He felt a call to go to the new land, the new world, America, and do ministry to the natives, to the indigenous people. He was invited by General Oglethorpe to come to Georgia. Him and his brother Charles went down, and on his way there, he was caught up in a storm, and he was so afraid of his life being taken away and so unsure of his salvation that he was shaken to the core. And he went and his ministry failed and he had conflict after conflict in the new world and he returned. And, and here's this person who started a holiness club who, who wanted to reform the Church of England, who, who got up and prayed every three hours, who, who developed a method for everything, who, who, who was in so intelligent, knew his Bible, and he didn't know God loved him until he went to a Bible study <laughs> and heard, heard an introduction that Martin Luther wrote to the book of Romans. God never uh, makes it clear when these kind of things can happen. Uh, but he went unwillingly, but he put himself in that position to hear God's voice. I think that's important. Sometimes when you're invited to do something you don't want to go, it's okay to go, <laughs> to be intentional. But you hear the conflict in the story. John knew his Bible. He grew up in church. He was the son of a pastor. He, he was involved in dangerous and all-in kind of ministry. Imagine in the 1700s taking a boat. This is pre-the United States, pre-Declaration of Independence, going to Georgia and trying to do ministry to an indigenous people. Yet he didn't know God loved him. And so, so if you're, if you're unsure, if, if you're conflicted, if you don't have that assurance, don't feel bad, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's okay. But when John had that moment, when his heart was strangely warmed, he knew for the first time in his life that God loved him, that all that garbage, all those mistakes, all that sin, all that trying to, trying to earn God's love, all that was wiped away. And he knew he was saved. He had assurance of God's love. Pray for that, friends, because that is life-changing. Our scripture reading today comes from 1 Peter. Uh, chapter 2, verse 21 through 25. You were called to this kind of endurance because Christ suffered on your behalf. He left you an example 
so that you might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, nor did he ever speak in ways meant to deceive. When he was insulted, he did not reply with insults. When he suffered, he did not threaten revenge. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He carried in his own body on the cross the sins we committed. He did this so that he might live in righteousness, having nothing to do with sin. By his wounds, you were healed. Though you were like a strange sheep, you've now returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your life. God bless the reading of the epistle. We're not going to spend a, a Norman an amount of time on atonement theory because this is a devotion and not uh, a lecture on atonement theory. But but I wanna I wanna try to help you get your guard down on some of this language that might be uncomfortable, uh, because when we talk about Jesus and the cross, when we talk about Jesus's life, death, and resurrection, his ascension and his returning, we refer to that as a great mystery. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We call that this holy mystery. It, it is beyond our scope, and we have different ways we try to understand it. And, and, and the writers of scripture and prophets and, and apostles have, have tried to understand it as well. But, but, but you see little glimpses of things that sometimes we, we look over when we get focused on, by his wounds you were healed, which I, I find so much truth in. But, but might be challenging if we get too caught on it. He left you an example. He did no wrong, yet he was insulted, and, and he didn't meet insult for insult. Did you hear that? And in, in, in the story, and we'll read it next week, Jesus didn't defend himself. He didn't try to get back at people. He, 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 he didn't have this kind of defensive human condition reaction that we have to, to change, to insult, to what perceived attacks, to perceived slights. We, we are so reactive. And Jesus showed us that none of that changes anything for good. And, and it bugs the heck out of me, especially when Christians, uh, but anybody, but, but especially when Christians, self-proclaimed Christians, are so reactive, and especially big public Christians, so reactive, so defensive. I, I try to work on that with my kids all the time, especially my boys when it comes to conflict. It, it takes two people to be in conflict. And, and either one of you, I, I have two boys, well, I have three children, but I have two boys that are always at each other's throats. And like it takes both of you. One of you can choose to stop any conflict. Anytime you're fighting, anytime things get too out of hand, one of you can make the choice. Both of you can make the choice, but it only takes one of you to stop and change things. I know how hard it is to, to have things said about you that aren't true, to be insulted, to be made fun of. But you also have a choice. It's a difficult choice, but you have a choice to know it doesn't matter. You have a choice to know that people who lash out are lashing out out of, out of fear, out of anger, out of anxiety, out of trauma. I, 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 and it doesn't justify their actions. That's not what I'm talking about. It doesn't mean you, you stay in negative relationships, but, but it does mean we have a compassion and we don't let it impact us because we are loved. If the God of the universe loves you, friends, who cares what little Timmy says or little Susie says on the playground? Again, it's a hard lesson. <laughs> I wish it was easy. I, I I wish I could just offer it to people and, and this this is how you do it. Like this is the, the trick. Uh, and I don't know the trick besides to say, if God is for you, who can be against you? Look at what Christ did. Follow his footsteps. Because it leads to life. It is the beginning of our week. And so we give thanks to God and praise God's name. Spend a minute thanking God for everything good in your life and praising God for the blessings you have received.
Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.